Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Jacqueline, Programs Manager at Earth Echo International. Here at Earth Echo, we're proud to work with an outstanding group of young leaders who help drive our work to empower their peers around the globe to take an active role in protecting our planet. We are joined today by one of our exceptional Youth Leadership Council members, Olivia. And Olivia is going to moderate today's live event. Thanks, Jacqueline. We are so excited to have students from all over the globe joining us as we tour the research vessel Anjari. This live event is part of STEM Explorer, Earth Echo's program that brings inspiration to life by telling the stories of dynamic female professionals in STEM careers during live virtual career connections. We want to thank our founding sponsor, United Technologies, for their support of women in STEM. Here at Earth Echo, we believe that youth have the power to change the planet. Visit earthecho.org to learn more about our programs. You can also access resources like STEM Explorer's career profile videos, as well as tune in for upcoming live events, just like this one. Just a reminder that you can send in questions anytime via chat, and we will break throughout today's presentation to answer your questions. Feel free to start typing questions in the chat space on YouTube or in the Zoom feed. We'll be sure to answer those as we go along. Now let's get started. We're so excited to have Dr. Amanda Waite from the Anjari Foundation join us, joining us today. Dr. Amanda Waite is an upstate New York native who, as many times as she's tried to escape, keeps finding herself back in Florida. Amanda has a BA in geology from Hamilton College, a master's in oceanography from the Uni University of Delaware's College of Earth, Ocean, and the Environment, and a PhD in marine ge geology and geophysics from, from the Rosenthal School of Marine and Atmospheric Science at the University of Miami. A, paleo a paleoceanographer and geochemist by training, Amanda studies the relationship between our oceans and climate and how they have changed throughout time, having conducted earth and marine science research in academic, museum, and petroleum industry settings. She's also maintained a commitment to science education throughout these endeavors, teaching at the college level as well as in K-12, through teacher professional development, and informal education settings. Amanda has an innate appreciation and passion for the power of hands-on field and lab-based learning in the sciences, and she is thrilled to be able to share this with audiences of all ages at Anjari Foundation. Amanda, can you tell us more about Anjari and what you do? Of course. Thank you guys. It's good to see you and have you here joining us today. Um, so if you want to go to that next slide for me, So before we get started on who our team consists of, um, I really want to just launch into what Anjari Foundation is. So we're dedicated to creating a global community that is interested, knowledgeable, and invested in marine science. And in order to do this, we directly support research initiatives that foster a greater trust and dialogue between scientists and the public. Um, for us, that means we're using innovative technology, hands-on educational experiences, film, and other media to raise awareness and strengthen science education. So the majority of our activities actually focus on our research vessel that you see in that image there on the right and that I'm sitting on today and that you're gonna get a tour of in just a moment. Um, our research vessel is a 65 foot vessel that was originally a private yacht uh, that the foundation acquired in 2016 and it undertook a six month refit on that vessel to turn it into what it is today. So the three pillars of what we do under the foundation um, as part of the foundation's programming include research, education, and film. So we support research scientists conducting marine uh, work in the field on their research programs, and that's a variety of scientists. Our goal with, with a vessel in particular was to make it as flexible as possible, to host a wide variety of scientists from physical oceanographers to marine biologists to chemical oceanographers um, on a super comfortable, flexible platform. Then, as much as possible, we also like to give youth, teachers, and members of our community opportunities to participate in that research alongside the scientists, to come out on board the vessel with us um, and get hands-on they literally get their hands and feet wet in this case, um, working on marine science research and conservation issues. For those that were unable to bring on the vessel, we have a film program. So we do create lots of short 2D films, but we also have our Generation Ocean 360 film series, which gives us fully immersive experiences that you can view in a virtual reality headset and allows us to bring the underwater world and life and work aboard a research vessel to classrooms uh, across the US and even the globe. So we work with educators to develop lesson plans and content that can be used in conjunction with those films um, and make that all freely available for distribution. Jacqueline, next slide. So in order to understand who we are and why we came to be, you have to understand who our founders are. So it truly is a family affair here at NGRA Foundation. So that is our board of directors, who you will see again in a moment, circa 1991. Um, they are a family of ocean lovers through and through, grew up on the water and loved it and everything about it. 
So you've got Lee and Chris, and then their two daughters, Angela and Carrie. And if you're wondering where the name Anjari came from, it's actually the merger of those two names, Angela and Carrie, together to create Anjari Foundation. So it's something that the family had been talking about for literally decades before acquiring this vessel and um, launching the foundation in 2016, um, merging their passions together to support marine science research and conservation. Next slide. So I want to introduce you to both our staff and our board of directors in a little bit more detail. And there's so much more that we could talk about today, but I really just want to give you an idea of the diversity of experience and expertise that they bring to the table. Um, because everybody is slightly different. So Angela Rosenberg, who you'll meet in just a moment on our virtual tour, is our president, our captain, and a director on our board. <laughs> um, she wears many hats, as do many of us, um, as you'll see. Uh, her hometown is Hilton Head, South Carolina. And like me, she has a marine science background by training. So she did bachelor's and, uh, uh, bachelor's and master's degrees at the University of Miami in marine science, biology, and marine geology and geophysics, and then did a business degree at the University of South Carolina. I'm also sharing, just for reference, a few of their passions. I basically asked our team to come up with their top four passions. So there you see for Angela, not surprisingly, it's the ocean, marine life, scuba diving, science, and boating. So Chris Davis is next on our list. She's the chairman of our board. Um, her hometown, she traveled a lot <laughs> when she was a child. Um, so she's been across the world, um, and now lives in West Palm Beach, Florida, here with Angela and myself and, and the rest of um, the folks that you see coming. She has a background in finance and statistics and is particularly focused on business and capital markets, okay? So she did a degree in finance um, and finance and statistics, her master's in finance and statistics at the University of Florida. She too is passionate about the ocean and activities like yachting, scuba diving and snorkeling, um, but also about building and growing businesses and really interested in the aerospace industry, which she spent like many years working in. She also is passionate about her family, her husband and her daughters, which obviously plays into the family up there. So next up, we've got Lee, uh, Lee being Chris's husband and Angela's father. Lee is also on our board of directors, but his hometown is Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. So we're starting to get a, a little further from the coast here. <laughs> he went to the University of Finland and had his degree in marketing and advertising, and really likes the creative side of the business. He was passionate about the ocean, activities involving yachting, scuba diving, snorkeling, traveling, golfing, <laughs> and also his family. Next slide. Hopefully, yeah. And last but not least, we've got Carrie. So Carrie is the other half of that Anjari equation, as I mentioned before. She's our vice president of production and also on our board. Um, she too is from Helen Head, South Carolina, but her, her schooling was actually in communication. So she took sort of a different approach than uh, the rest of the family. She's passionate about filmmaking, writing, and storytelling, the Ocean Institute are. And she actually works full-time for Marvel currently in California. So she's our one non-West <laughs> Palm Beach-based person on the team. Um, comes out and leads those Generation Ocean 360 film productions that I mentioned earlier. Next. You've already met me. I don't think you need any additional background on this. Um, as I mentioned, I am from upstate New York, so I don't want anybody getting the idea that you can't study the oceans because you didn't grow up near the oceans and you can't be passionate about it. It's going to be further from the truth. Um, I actually grew up on the water, but it was mountain lakes in upstate New York, so a little bit different, but it inspired a love of nature and all things water for me there. Um, we can go to the next one. Rachel Plunkett is our newest addition to the team. So she is our media and marketing associate. And that means it's her job to really go out there and bridge those gaps to the community through our website, social media, um, other media outlets, working with news to share the research stories associated with the people that we're working with. Um, she's from Simmons in New Jersey originally and has an environmental policy degree from Rutgers University, as well as a marine biology degree from Florida Atlantic. She too loves scuba diving and underwater photography, um, both useful here, and aviation and mountain backpacking, perhaps not so much, but we all need diversity in our interests. Mm -hmm. Last up, we've got Kevin Davidson. So Kevin is our relief captain on the vessel. Um, he's also our engineer and our mate. He too wears many hats. Uh, his hometown is Moline, Illinois, and he just walked past me <laughs> behind me here on the boat. So he takes the cake for being the furthest we've got from the oceans for growing up. Um, he has a degree from Manatee Community College in computer drafting. Uh, he enjoys underwater photography. He spent a great deal of time in marine industries, including yachting, uh, scuba instruction, and underwater photography. You'll be seeing a lot more of his imagery throughout the rest of this talk. Also likes golfing, sailing, and cooking, which is very important because both Angela and Kevin do the cooking of the muscle for the scientists for our expedition. We have an active internship program. So you're seeing there the slew of interns we've had over the last several years. 
And we do do interns during the spring, summer, and then fall semesters, roughly four month internships, and you get fully immersed in all programming that is in Jari through that experience. Next. So as I mentioned, we're based in West Palm Beach, which means we're on that little point of land that sticks off the side to the east of Florida there. But as you can imagine with a boat that travels, we do have sort of a wider range that we can cover. So we say that we have a range from the East Coast, the Caribbean and the Gulf of Mexico, but the majority of our work occurs within that box you're seeing there. So if we go to the next slide <clears throat> and focus on that, you can see that's largely South Florida, uh, including the Florida Keys, uh, Skane Bay, um, Florida Bay, also St. Pete, uh, Tampa area and the entire sort of East Coast from Palm Beach down to Miami. We also do a lot of work in the Bahamas. Next. So we've had, since our launch, which was our official launch was in April of 2017, um, but uh, the vessel actually set sail for the first time in October of 2016. We've had 33 expeditions over that time period. And you can see in those images on the left, those are just thumbnails. If you go on our website, we do do descriptions of all of those expeditions, brief summaries with a highlight reel of 16 photos from each um, and all of the affiliates. So it's something you can check out if you're interested in learning more about the individual expeditions. These 33 expeditions have consisted of 189 days at sea and 9,048 nautical miles travel. During those expeditions, we welcomed 180 scientists and 236 students, teachers, and citizen scientists on board. So as we mentioned, we don't want to just support the marine scientists um, in their research endeavors, but also find ways for them to engage with the public and integrate others into the field work. So we tried, um, have tried as much as possible, and many of those expeditions involve us taking middle schoolers, um, some high schoolers out on the water with us to participate in science alongside those. So without further ado, I think that that should bring us to a vessel tour. So unfortunately, Angela was not able to be with us today to give the vessel tour in person, but I had her pre-record, Captain Angela pre-recorded a video tour. So we should head over to the next and then we'll take questions. All right, here we go. You have audio. Yeah, one second. Let's see. Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love technology, huh? Bear with me, everybody. Let's make sure that we have audio. One second. I'm gonna do some troubleshooting real quick. So actually, while Jacqueline's working on that, um, Amanda, do you mind if I ask you a question real quick? Yeah, no, go for it. I was gonna suggest that. Mm -hmm. So I know you mentioned that you um, grew up like on lakes and that was really how you got interested. What was it that I, you know, looking at your background and how you have such a diverse like so academic and science background, what was it that really made you say like the ocean is what I wanna study? It was sort of a slow transition in ways. So I grew up snorkeling in, like I said, cold water lakes, loved the water, could just get lost all day if I wanted to. Um, I went on to an undergrad degree in geology that I sort of got involved with paleontology and marine paleontology in particular. And I took a lot of post, uh, classes related to coastal geology and oceanography. And fortunately for us at Hamilton College, we had a really intensive field program and getting to hang out on, <laughs> on the coast or on the water as part of uh, the degree pretty much sealed the deal for me. <laughs> and then I made the transition coming out of undergrad over to the master's into a full marine program at that time. So it's, I had research that I'd done as an undergrad that was still tied to the marine realm, but was very much in a landlocked state, obviously. Just ancient right, right. marine realm. <laughs> very cool. All right, let's see. Ready, guys? Fingers crossed. Oh, there it is. Hello, come join me for a tour of Research Vessel Andari. Of the depth and what the bottom and the symmetry look like, 
all the way to radar to show you other things that are around you and really helpful at night and when there's low visibility. Communications like a VHF radio and sat phone. And then we also have cameras throughout the vessel that we use for security and to get a better idea of what's happening when we're at the helm, what's going on back of the stern. So we have all of our cameras set up here and we can see the engine room and if there's anything going on in there, in the lab, off the stern, um, even an underwater camera to look behind the boat and see what might be underwater. This is our Jari's engine room. So as you might be able to see, we have two huge engines that push this vessel along at 10 knots. We also have two large generators, one on each side, that provides a huge amount of power so that we can conduct various scientific studies from the vessel, ACs, equipment, air compressor, galley, everything you might need for our own power plant. We also on board have a water maker, so we can create up to 500 gallons of water per day. That's drinking water, as well as for showers, toilets, and anything else you might need. We have stabilizer fins, which actually adjust to the movement of the ocean and the seas around us to try to make the vessel stay more upright and not rock back and forth as much. A huge amount of batteries, pumps, and a ton of other systems and units that keep this vessel operating at top notch. Here we are in our biggest guest stateroom. So this room we call the triple because you can sleep three scientists. One, two, and a pullman up here comes down to sleep a third. They also have their own bathroom. This is another one of our guest staterooms. We call it the bunk room and it sleeps two. This is our third and final guest stateroom. If you're lucky enough to be the chief scientist, this room's yours. Like everyone, researchers have to eat. So here we have a fully stocked galley, kitchen for those who aren't on boats, with a full fridge, freezer, oven, sink, and even some freshly baked cookies. Now we're on a jarred fly bridge. This is the upper deck. And if you can see or look around, you now have a higher view of everything around us. We have another helm station up here, which is great because it does give you that bird's eye view as you're maneuvering and working on different um, things. And we have a huge seating area. So this is a great spot for scientists and crew after a long day to relax, have dinner, and just chill out and get ready for the next one. Aft deck spaces on board RV and Jari are set up for lots of different scientific work. So up here we have a huge table that we can set samples up from otter troughs, plankton toes, sediment grab samples. And then and you can also come down to our cockpit just down a couple steps away. On the stern of the vessel, we have a protected area with, that is great for setting up any sort of water-related field work. So whether you're scuba diving, we carry 18 scuba tanks on board, dive gear, regulators, BCs, and all the necessary uh, accessories, as well as an air compressor. Or if you're setting up a plankton tow, maybe drum lines for shark tagging, or anything else that you need some outside space for. Then it's also quick access to our back swim platform. This is Andrari's swim platform. So as you can see, we're super close to the water here. And this is a great way to enter in dive gear if you're going for a dive or doing any sort of scientific surveys underwater. This is also a fantastic platform to pull up a shark for tagging. We can work with the shark right next to our platform here. And also fantastic for bringing in trawls, plankton toes, or anything else where you need quick, easy water access. We are now standing in RBN Jari's indoor lab space. So this actually used to be a living room, a salon or a private yacht with couches and a chair over here and TV. And we took all that out and we converted it for scientific research and education. So now we have lab furniture throughout. We have chemical grade countertops so people can conduct chemistry analyses and experiments. We have a deep lab sink, even an eye wash for safety. And over here we have 
that much more counter space. So you can set up various equipment, film or photography, cameras, computer for inputting data or working and filling out your lab notebooks. Anything you need to do, you can now do in our indoor lab space, air conditioned and ready for work. Okay, awesome. Well, after seeing that, now we get a really good visual of what the entire Anjari looks like, which is pretty incredible. Um, and especially as a marine biologist myself, it makes me pretty envious too. I really want to be a chief scientist one day so I can uh, use that better. Let's do it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but my first question for you um, is what is a typical day like on the Anjari? Ah, okay, so for a typical expedition day, it really depends on the expedition. It can vary quite a bit. So the majority of the expeditions that I participate in are single day trips. So we're actually leaving from our home port here in Palm Beach. I um, mean, that's because the majority of the ones that I participate in are the education trips. So usually we're taking a group out with us, right? So we can't do the long extended trips with them. Um, we'd meet at the dock pretty early, usually try to get off the dock by about 8 a.m. at the latest uh, to get underway. And for us, we have to transit out of the lagoon here. So there's usually about 45 minutes underway where the scientists and any other participants have an opportunity to sort of set the tone for the day, right? Talk about what our activities are going to be, what our goals and objectives are, and how we're going to operate when we get out there. Um, if we're local here and we're headed offshore, maybe to shark tag. We then spend a day setting drum lines and uh, set drum lines, let them soak for about an hour, recover them, and keep going until our research was complete. Um, usually coming back to the dock about five or six o'clock at night. Debriefing on our way back in and everybody disembarks. If you're on a research expedition though, that can vary widely. So for instance, um, Kevin and Angela have recently gotten back from trips in the Bahamas where they've been doing coral surveys with six divers, where they would do six plus dives in a day with literally hundreds of surveys. So in that case, you're pretty much sun up to sundown running dive operations on board, or on, from on board. Um, with meals, of course, intersprinkled in between, right? So <laughs> to cap off the day. And then very often with our researchers that are staying on board, they then spend their evenings inputting that data into the computers or setting up their plan for the next day in advance. So it's usually quite a bit of work with a little bit of play mixed in if at all possible. <laughs> Absolutely, that sounds incredible. So my next question for you is, so you were describing so many of the different research activities that go on from like day to day on the Anjari. So if, a, if somebody um, who was, you know, going into college or was a high school student or middle school student really wanted to go and become one of these scientists who can collect these data, um, what kind of tips would you get for them? What kind of classes would you study? What skills would they need to know? All of your passions. That sort of, there are really, I think a lot of people um, tend to think that marine science is very narrowly focused and usually think marine biology is sort of what it is. I mentioned I'm a marine geologist, so I didn't come into it. I had some biology background um, from the mi uh, minor side, but the majority of my background is in geology. We work with engineers, we worked with physical oceanographers who are super passionate about math. <laughs> you know, it really, you can take a number of different approaches to marine science. Um, and in that case, I would kind of recommend you sort of looking through, there's a lot of resources out there or ask us and I'll direct you to them. We're happy to do that here um, that talk about some of the different options for careers within marine sciences and what types of skills would be required for that. Right, absolutely. And what about some of those other uh, jobs that may be necessary on the boat? Like you mentioned, you know, being the captain or being the chef yeah. on the boat. What are some of the other things that you would, um, you know, other jobs that may need filled on a boat like the Anjari? But for us, it, it's perhaps a little bit unique to your average research vessel. So we operate with a full-time crew of two when we do most of these expeditions, the science expeditions. And in that case, we've got Angela and Kevin doing everything on board from operating the vessel to running the dive operations to cooking, um, you name it, it's their responsibility. Um, and same goes for underwater photography. So that's part of the reason we put together and assembled the team we did with all of their different experiences was to really be able to capture all of those niches within a very small staff <laughs> that we have here. Um, but that can vary depending upon what research vessel you work on. So some of the vessels with, associated with the university, they have crews of tens to twenties <laughs> of uh, crew members on board who have experiences or experience in everything from engineering to vessel operations. Um, 
take a voting class. If you're interested in a voting class, if you're a youth especially, like there are ways to get involved in the marine industry side of things and kind of feel out what might be, uh, my, what might be the direction you'd like to go in. But I will say that I have already told my whole team it's very happy to answer questions. So we're gonna throw an email up at the end and if anybody you have a question for, they will <laughs> respond. So if you're particularly interested in say what Kevin does or the likes, you can, you can arrange that. <laughs> Right, right. Jacqueline, do we have any more questions from our Zoom or our YouTube? We have one question from YouTube, and that is, Amanda, can you tell us what is the coolest encounter you've had on your research vessel? Oh, so I feel like my coolest encounter may not be as cool as some of the others. <laughs> some of the others, what my captains would say, because they haven't been on the same, we haven't all been on the same expeditions. So I actually, as much as I love the critters we get to work with, um, I've seen some amazing very large like tiger and hammerhead sharks that are absolutely phenomenal. What I like is when I get a super energetic group of kids out there and I see the ocean through their eyes for the first time. There's nothing like watching how excited sea spray is or how excited the smallest critters in the ocean can be when you're seeing it all for the first time, right? That having been said, I have to cave and say that they just recently got back from a great hammerhead uh, research expedition in the Bahamas like a couple weeks ago. And from what I've heard, the diving was amazing and that I think probably ranks up there for some of them. <laughs> Great. Well, that's all the questions we have for now, but we'll come back um, for some more questions in a little bit if you want to continue. Awesome. All right. So we touched on, uh, in the video, we touched on some of the different research, but I kind of wanted to just highlight some of the research in the context of marine biodiversity in particular, because I know this is part of the biodiversity teaching, right? So with the teams that we've had on board, we're working with everything from the tiniest little critters in the ocean. So plankton, you heard Angela mention um, in her video too, are these plankton toes, which if you can just barely make it out in the upper left image there, um, is basically a giant mesh funnel um, with a bottle at the bottom. So the bottle you're seeing in the middle, top middle image there that collects the tiny little microscopic plants and animals that live in the ocean. And we do these plankton toes on a lot of our expeditions, in particular, a lot of our education expeditions, because you can always rely on the plankton to be there. And often, because it's not the thing you can see with your naked eye, people just don't think about it. But it plays an integral role in the food webs for the oceans. So everything from those tiny little plankton that you see being studied here to, next slide. Coral reefs um, being another one of the, the um, key species or, or groups of species. In this case, we're looking at whole reef communities um, that have been studied from onboard Antares. So we've worked with a number of researchers. You can see a, a series of the logos there, both from different universities, but also different funding agencies in the Bahamas and in Florida, assessing coral reef health, um, conducting what are known as the Atlantic and Open Reef Assessment Surveys. Um, which involves looking at everything from coral cover and coral health to the benthic uh, organisms that happen to be living in these areas, to the fish populations, the collected photo imagery. You can see in the upper left, we've got a diver with a camera. And the middle image there, you see they're collecting a coral, a core from a coral, which would actually be something that I would use to analyze. That's what I did my PhD on. Um, and then in the far images on the right, you see that we've also worked with a supporting um, coral reef nursery initiatives. Um, there, there's a, there's a team in the Bahamas on top that's assessing their coral reef nursery there. Those are tiny little coral fragments all hanging from lines, um, buoyed lines. And then on the bottom, you see uh, from our trip last year with Coral Restoration Foundation um, during their Coral Blues event, where they were taking those small fragments of corals back out onto the coral reef to transplant them and help to replenish our reefs and, and try to build up what has been lost in the Florida Keys. So some things on the sort of small side, working up to some of the larger critters that we've worked with. Um, we've done sea turtle research with a number, uh, research and education initiatives actually with a number of organizations you see there, um, both in the Florida and the Bahamas. And so that includes everything from uh, electing measurements, so that far right image, you see that they're taking a measurement um, from the carapace of that turtle, to putting a tag on the turtle. So if it's ever recaptured, you know which one it was and you can compare the data um, from one trip to the next. The bottom image there, you see a satellite tag that can also be affixed to the turtle. So you can actually see that was during nesting season. They're working at night because they're looking at where the turtles are, are migrating and moving um, during the nesting season. So not only are we supporting a wide, uh, research involving a wide number of organisms, but there's a number of different research techniques and methods that are applied by the scientists that we're working with. The sea turtles also um, was part of a program with Digital Life where they were taking 3D imagery of a sea turtle in order to be able to have a 3D model that can be viewed on a computer, 3D printed, used in an AR module in order to see a 3D 
the model of the sea turtle. Um, so other components that not only let you build on the research itself, but also are other educational tools that can be integrated. Next slide. And then working up to some of the larger uh, <laughs> apex predators that we've worked with from onboarding and jarring sharks. We've actually supported a good deal of shark research, both between, again, Florida and the Bahamas here with a number of different entities, as you can see. Um, so this has included research, education programs, and even some film trips. Um, so things like an oceanic white, trip, uh, white tip expedition associated with Discovery Channel Shark Week, or a shark fest expedition to the Bahamas as well, was also part of the, uh, the equation. So, Filming is still a critical component of that. <laughs> Here again with sharks, it's everything from collecting measurements and putting um, basically ID tags on sharks to attaching a satellite tag so we can see where that shark has traveled to. Um, all done by our researchers that are coming out on board. Now, bottom image you see on the left there is actually from that hammerhead trip too that I was just talking about. So in this case, you can, if, hopefully you can make out there's a camera on there, a series of cameras on poles around that image. And here they were actually trying to capture imagery, high resolution imagery to um, make a 3D model of a moving hammerhead. And so that is in the works now. Um, they just got back from the expedition, so lots of processing happening, but different types of research. And that will also, that will be used both for research purposes and also sharing with public for educational purposes. So I think that's one of the things that's coolest about what we get to do here at Anjari Foundation, the opportunity for us is I'm not just working in my own research field anymore, but we get to support and share um, with others the research of a vast array of scientists that are doing great things for our oceans and ocean conservation. So at this point, I can take any other questions if you've got them. Okay, awesome. Well, I will ask one of my questions. And okay. that is you talked about so many different, like you really covered like the entire food web, which I loved going all the way from like plankton to sharks, which is awesome. So, <laughs> which I think is really cool. Uh, what um, my kind of question for you is, you know, we're talking about biodiversity here and how have you seen some of these ecosystems change even just, you know, throughout your career so far? Ah, okay, interesting question. So I actually didn't do um, my, well, I did my degree at the University of Miami in terms of corals, and I have seen some change in the corals themselves. Unfortunately, we all know that we've seen a loss of coral coverage in Florida in particular, um, various places around the world. But we've definitely seen a decline both in the particular species that we're seeing, but also in the coral cover. And unfortunately, we're dealing with a lot of disease currently um, in the Florida reef tract as well. That's something that is all hands on deck in terms of the scientific community investigating that. Um, in terms of some of these other species, I have, a lot of them I personally have only been working with for the last few years, right, as we uh, started taking part for Anjari. But I know from the researchers that we're working with, say on shark research, um, one topic that's coming up and actually very relevant right now is the black tip shark migration here in Florida. So this is a, uh, a condition where or a time of year where we have usually thousands of black tip sharks migrating the coastline just offshore here, particularly close for us. Um, and the researchers at Florida Atlantic University that Stephen Kajara has been doing that has really noticed the decline in the number of sharks that he's seen during these migrations. And they're trying to relate that to changes in temperature of the water and other conditions. So we know that we're seeing pretty drastic changes in migratory patterns and abundance of particular species in different areas throughout Florida or motion of some species into other areas where they have not previously been. Wow, that's really interesting. And hopefully the research that you're, you know, fueling here will continue to help us to like see why these changes are happening and, you know, what Absolutely. we can do to address them. Um, so do we actually do have a question from Cami, and she would like to know, are there any additional research fields you or the team are interested in working with or supporting in the future? Oh, great question. Um, so let's see. Uh, I think we, we've talked about, I personally would love to get into more geological field work, <laughs> and we haven't done a ton of it, and even physical oceanography as well. Um, but talking about doing some things with sediment sampling in the area, but also possibly bottom surveys um, through some of our regions, in particular here where we are, we're in the Lake Worth Lagoon, which has a lot of development, but a lot of motion of sand and sediment particulates within the lagoon that changes the way that the bottom looks on, on a, a regular basis, if you will. So I think personally, I would love to get into geology. Um, we, we're we happy to branch out. I'm trying to think of what are the dream fields. More physical oceanography work would be fun too. So that's a little bit different from the marine biodiversity topic, but um, we've deployed like the drifter into the Gulf Stream and watch where that's tracked and track that with students. And there's some really cool opportunities associated with that. So hopefully we'll get to do a little bit more of that in the future. Um, 
one thing I like to say is we're happy to explore new avenues, even if you don't think it's necessarily something that would be a good fit or you don't quite see in, in what we've already presented, what you can work on or what might align. We're happy to explore making your research work from on board or doing what we can to facilitate that. So. Very cool. And I'll ask one last question, and that is, you know, we've talked a little bit about um, how the oceans are changing and how, all the different techniques that you use to monitor those changes. Um, from your standpoint, what is, you know, as the expert in this field, what is at least, you know, one or two takeaways that you'd say that, like, what is something that I could do, maybe if I'm not, never even seen the ocean or never even been on the coast, like, what are some things that I can do um, to help improve biodiversity in these ecosystems? I'd say number one is become informed, ask questions, you know, check out, follow when you hear things about things on the news. I know the ocean is a long ways away maybe for some of you, but don't totally ignore what you're hearing. Um, and feel free to reach out and ask questions of those who are doing the work. Many of them are very happy, happy to share what they've learned. And when you do learn the cool and exciting or fun fact that you had, um, or that you found, share it with others. Just try to sort of work it into your conversation and something, make it something that you think about in your day-to-day -day life, if you will. Um, then there are a lot of issues that I may not seem as closely tied, but things like marine debris, where even if you are not on the coast, marine debris can be transported by rivers and streams out to the coast, even from areas pretty far inland, right? So that might seem like something that's a very separate distinction from you, but there are things you can do to re reduce single-use plastics or to encourage others to do the same. Um, properly secure and dispose of trash, learn more about more sustainable living in your area that can actually have a significant impact on what's happening on the coastal environment. And that's wherever you are on earth, right? <laughs> not necessarily. Um, we care about other bodies of water too, for the record, <laughs> this is not just the ocean. So there are definitely small changes that you can make, um, but that a lot of them do just rely on you sort of taking an interest and asking those questions and, and learning more. And don't be afraid to do that. Right. Those are all great tips. And even just watching this uh, video uh, is Absolutely. really helpful in that and being part of this virtual field trip can be, you know, helpful and just informing yourself on like what's going on, even if it's not even in your own backyard. Um, and actually, I do have one more question um, okay. is uh, this is actually from Rachel and she says, do all marine scientists work on research vessels? Uh, definitely not. <laughs> so by training here, I actually did very little research on a research vessel as a marine scientist during my master's or PhD. I spent almost the entirety of my time in a lab. So, um, and if I did do field work, it was usually off of very small boats. So that's definitely not a limiting factor. I've even known people who do spend a good deal of time on their boats that get very, very seasick for the marine scientists. So if the boat thing or offshore is intimidating to you, don't let that stop you. In terms of marine scientists, there's plenty of folks that work from labs, work from shore-based settings, um, and don't do research that requires a vessel to conduct those operations. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm also one of those marine scientists who sometimes yeah. does get seasick depending on what it's like. So yeah, the good thing is, there the is of us. <laughs> you know, it's good. There are medicines, there are things that you can take. So even, in, you know, maybe you're not even interested in being a sea. There's so many different ways that you can be involved in marine research and not even, you know, I'm in a lab right now and I right. barely, you know, get to go out to sea. So there's lots of different ways that you can help uh, further this field, which I think is awesome. Absolutely. And even if you're not passionate about science necessarily too, there's lots, I mean, we've got Carrie and Phil making helping us further our message um, as well so there's different there's different avenues that you can pursue to tie back into it well, that's great. Well, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank and you. any educators wishing to learn more or be kept up to date on Anjari Foundation's education programs, including vessel offerings, 360 film and virtual reality, or professional development opportunities, are encouraged to register on Anjari Foundation's site at the link shown here. Registration is simple and free and provides exclusive access to Anjari Foundation's educational programming. Earth Echo International also invites you to join us for all of our exciting programs, including expeditions, water challenge, and STEM Explorer. And lastly, we're so excited to announce a brand new program from Earth Echo International. I'm Philip Gusto, and I am so excited to announce the latest program from Earth Echo International. It's called the Our Echo Challenge, and it's a new way for students to protect biodiversity and get the funding to do it. The Our Echo Challenge empowers teams of middle school students to explore their community, identify threats to local species, and then submit an idea for a project that will help to restore a healthy ecosystem. Ten finalist teams will join Earth Echo International in Washington, D.C. to present their ideas 
and the top three teams will be awarded grants to turn their project into a reality. Go to OurEchoChallenge.org and join our STEM competition by submitting your plan to change the world. So as you just saw, the Our Echo Challenge is a STEM innovation competition that empowers U.S. middle school students to take a closer look at biodiversity in their communities. Students will first identify threats to local ecosystems and then propose solutions to help preserve, protect, or repair those natural resources. Ten finalist teams will join Earth Echo International in Washington, D.C., where they will present their ideas to restore or protect local biodiversity. The top three teams will be awarded up to $10,000 in grants to turn their projects into a reality. Visit our website to submit your plan to save the world. Our deadline is March 22nd this year. Be sure to stay connected with Earth Echo on our social media channels and website. And of, of course, a very special thank you to the Anjari Foundation, Dr. Amanda Waits, and the National Biodiversity Teach-In and the students and teachers at Elgin High School for inviting us to be part of this tremendous event. On behalf of Earth Echo International, thank you for joining us and keep exploring.